So the recording is in progress um, and I will begin the webinar if you all are ready. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cooking with History. My name is Cassandra Michaud and I'm an archeologist with Montgomery Parks. And today we are hosting this event from the Josiah Henson Museum and Park in North Bethesda, Maryland. While we're holding this event as part of our Black History Month celebration, the Josiah Henson Museum and Park focuses on that history 365 days a year. And you can go visit the Josiah Henson Museum in person or visit our website at josiahhenson.org. Uh, to learn more about who he was and the museum. The remarkable, um, today we'll all be moderating a remarkable panel and discussing with our wonderful guests and we'll meet them in just a second. First, I wanna go through some housekeeping. Uh, today's discussion will be about an hour long. The last 15 minutes or so are reserved for any questions you have for the panel. So please use the, the chat feature to enter any of your questions in and we'll be sure to get to them at the end. Amani Haynes, who's our education program manager extraordinaire for the Josiah Henson Museum is not only our organizer of today's events, but is also behind the scenes, making sure everything runs smoothly and monitoring the chat. Today's event is called Cooking with History and we want to focus on that topic because food is such an elemental part of culture, history and identity. That fact is embodied in the scope of the panelists backgrounds and in the wide range of topics we'll be exploring today. So I'm thrilled to learn more from our panelists' experiences. So let's begin with some introductions. We'll go ahead and start with Psyche williams Forson. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Psyche williams Forson, professor and department chair at the University of Maryland College Park in the Department of American Studies. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Trace Nelson. I'm a chef, a writer, and the founder of the website BlackColonialHistory.com. Hello everyone, I'm Kelly Fonto Dietz and I'm the Director of Collections and Visitor Engagement at Stratford Hall and the author of Bound of the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. Great, so let's jump right into our discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides um, and begin a little, with a little bit of an overview. Um, food is both a form of subsistence and a form of expression. And here at the museum, which is, was the site of a former plantation, food is interwoven into every aspect of its existence. The plantation economy revolved around food production using enslaved labor and its sale for profit. In his narrative, Josiah Henson describes the situation. The fertile fields were once that once waved across acres of tasseled corn, of blooming rye and oats and barley, the once plowed land where grew the endless rows of potatoes in which I had hoed so many weary hours, the rich pastures where great herds of cattle used to graze. So he describes the situation. The crops used to feed the Rileys and to take the market to George and to take into market to Georgetown. Over the years, the plantation house and fields had been transformed into suburban development, and that history has become obscured, something that is embodied in the trans transformation of the main house which underwent a major renovation in the 1930s, which you see on the screen here. One aspect of the museum we want visitors to understand and to leave with is that there is a direct thread between the past and the present, and that the idea in mind we want to start today's discussion within the discussion of soul food, and specifically with the psyche. Although the, the term soul food originated in the 1960s and 70s amidst the Black Power Movement, the origin of this cuisine actually began during slavery. Can you share with us its origin and its story? Okay, thank you, um, <clears throat> Cassandra. Yeah, well, I guess what I would say about soul food is that it's food. Okay, we're talking about, really just talking about food. Um, and when you say it originated in, during enslavement, um, it's, slavery was over centuries, right? Um, from the 1600s to the 1800s. It was pervasive, meaning it was everywhere. Um, and people ate different things during enslavement, depending upon if they were on a farm, if they were on a plantation, what they had access to, what they didn't have access to. But one of the things that I would share is that 
Um, and I say this a lot because while we talk about what in, uh, enslaved people were given, um, what we don't talk about is how black folks think and survive. If you're surrounded by forestry, you're not going to starve. You're going to go into the forest and figure out what you can eat, whether it's berries, nuts, um, grasses, um, different types of wildlife. Um, so I think it's important for us to remember that those stories don't get captured in our discussions of Black people's early food ways, nor do they get uh, captured in our discussion of soul food. So I'm going to share my screen very, very quickly because I want to give my panelists time to say a word. Um, but, and what did, uh, let me see here. I just had my, all right. Let me, I just want to show a couple of quick slides and, and make a, a comment on uh, what you were saying about um, about soul food. So um, very quickly, when we tend to think of soul food, we think of this here, right? Um, you know, ham and sweet potatoes and biscuits and coffee, that absolutely can be a fried chicken and so forth and so on, right? And absolutely those foods, because they tended to be cooked a particular way in the South and were thus shared by Southerners, it makes perfect sense that this is how we see soul food, not to mention this is how we've seen it in popular culture. But I have another concept that I wanna share about what Amiri Baraka, but first what Eldridge Cleaver said about soul food and how um, it's one thing when you have to eat certain foods, it's another thing when you opt to eat certain foods. And Eldridge Cleaver, who was part of the Black Panther movement speaking before Baraka, um, basically was saying, you know, white folks it, who eat these foods and, and call them, you know, soul food or what have you, have that choice. Black people, however, these are the foods we have access to and sometimes don't have access to. So what I just want to share very quickly is that while all these foods are eaten by Southerners, when Baraka um, and others join soul to food, then they're talking about soul as a signifier to food. And they're making soul do some work, all right? And so by calling out the ways these foods are cooked, the ingredients, spices, flavoring, and the methods of cooking, that highlights the ingenuity, creativity, and skill learned out of necessity. And it was a way of keeping on in spite of, and yet because of what was happening around people. It's like what Isaac said, Hay says in the song, Soul Man. It's about rising above your present condition. It's almost like boasting, it's a pride thing. So with soul food, not only do black people play the culinary dozens by trying to one up one another in their cooking, but we moan when the food is good, we show our creativity and we boast loudly about anything and everything from hogs, intestines, chicken feet, backs and necks to tofu and, uh, you know, and caviar, right? So I wanna leave us today with a different concept of soul food. It's not just about food, it's a way of being. Right, And not only does soul food satiate, but it reveals perseverance and resourcefulness and creativity by Black people in the face of myriad oppressions. Um, and so it was, soul food really becomes an action as opposed to, um, it, it becomes more of an action as opposed to a particular set of foods. Preach. I want to, first of all, thank you so much for bringing up Baraka because the thing about I always sort of, when I sit with soul food um, as a construct, I sit with Vernon May Grosner, right? Mm -hmm. I think about how she talked about the active posture of soul food. Mm -hmm. And so much of what she talked about, especially like later in her work, was like, why are we so tied to the static nature of soul food in this really particular context? And that this idea about the mobility, like your point about the length of time we should be sort of considering is about the sort of ingenuity as it morphs and changes and moves and evolves. And we are so stuck to the images you put up in terms of these static foods. Of course, soul food should evolve. Black food has always evolved because we always yeah. have been sort of in community with, in, you know, sort of tangential to all kinds of experiences, but we use this sort of safe space of the, the kitchen mm -hmm. to kind of be this creative outlet that, signifies the time in which it exists so modern in the modern context i feel like the pushback in terms of culinary space has always been about this feeling of legibility mm -hmm. and this feeling of sort of trying to figure out a way to 
move a consumer's mind beyond this static identity. Like the static sort of collection of food, right? Like right. The, and, and I want to give Kelly a, a, a minute here, but I just want to respond to that. But that's about control, isn't it? Because Black chefs, and you can speak to this certainly, um, when we see them on uh, cooking shows and things of that nature, it always has to be pigeonholed around a particular kind of food, right? As if that's all we can manage. And so that really is about, and it's going to tie into the question we have about stereotypes. It's about power and control. Right. When in reality, for Black people, soul food, like Jessica says, who knew it was soul food? We were eating it all our lives, right? Or as Miss um, uh, uh, Miss Leah Chase said, what is that? She was like, we don't have that in New Orleans. We have Creole soul, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when people come to Dookie Chase's and they're like, well, I'm looking for mac and cheese, and like, you may not find that, but that's part of the control of black bodies, as I say, black people's bodies in our minds and our psychological being. And when we put that out into the universe, it really puts us right here, which makes it difficult from a chef's perspective and to own black restaurants and so forth. Because if we don't conform to what mama taught us how to make and sitting at our grandmother's feet, then apparently the food is no good. Cause obviously we're not able to cook, you know, beyond, <laughs> you know, black, the black, the black South. Right. So I'll go. go ahead, Kelly. What were you going to say? Jump in here. I know you got something. To say. That was awesome. Y'all just slayed it. So I just want to, um, I'm working, I just finished working on a book called California Soul with uh, Tanya Holland and Alice Walker's doing the forward and I'm so hype about it. And I think when I, and I grew up in California and Oakland. And so it's, I think just sort of finishing up sort of what you both talked about, seeing how those different threads of different areas and regions and dishes and feelings about food manifests itself so differently in places like California as well. And there's something so strong about that energy, that power that's put onto there that it can withhold, I mean, withstand anything. It can make it all the way across 3000 miles and end up in the Bay Area. And it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thread in sort of texture of American culinary history. So that's all I'm gonna add to that. But y'all were, that was beautiful what you just said, both of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed, that was fantastic. And I think it really highlights sort of the fluidity of not just food, but culture. And so one of, um, we're going to go ahead and actually move on to our second topic. We have quite a lot to talk about today. Um, and as I said, I think before is that this could, we could spend an hour on each one of these, but we want to move on to sort of a, the second idea here. Um, we want to talk about the kitchen as a space and controlling the kitchen and how you use it and how it's seen. So I'm going to just take a second to share again and share some images. Again, I'm going to work from um, just the Josiah Henson site, which is where we're at. And so we sort of titled this the cooker versus the eater um, and in contrasting, um, you know, an enslaved cook with the Riley women here who are on the folks on the, on the right. So at the Josiah Henson Park, the log kitchen and the main house are the only 19th century structures left on the plantation of the plantation period. Um, and it's really central to the experience here. Um, the entire property underwent this major renovation in the 1930s by the Bolton family. And this image on the left is um, the kitchen space as they renovated it into their family den. And the, kid, and, the, and the image on the right is of the space as it is now. And so what we did is that we, there's a partially reconstructed loft. This would have been the space where the enslaved cook uh, worked and lived, as well as many other activities, including sewing and washing, and, and there would have been children. Many of the enslaved on the plantation were actually very young, under than 16. This would have been that heart of the plantation. Um, and so one of the things that, to me, when I look at this, this talks about how these histories um, become transformed from one of a place of labor to a place of leisure, in this case. And also, um, we, you know, one of our, our goals is to actually go back and try and peel back both in terms of archaeology and in terms of the architectural history, remove all of those modifications to get back to what this would have been like in the 1850s. Um, we also, um, these are just images of some of the, the food remains, some wheat and uh, carbonized corn that we found through a midden site from a kitchen that appears to have come from a kitchen um, context, and that we, along with many other food items. And so we deal with the material record, but so much of, as you've already mentioned, it's about behavior, which is really what we're looking at as archaeologists as well. What is the behavior? And, you know, this is the behavior, right? People, the work that went into preparing food is really so much of cooking right? 
the actual harvesting and the preparing of the food items and the processing of the meat. Um, and so what we um, sort of want to, what I want to move into is sort of how you all think about that experience of the food itself, the work and the kitchen space. Um, so specifically, Kelly, let's start with you. Um, through your work, what have you found out about sort of this dichotomy of the cooker and the eater through artifacts, through culture? So I love talking about kitchens. Um, I was a professional chef for 10 years before I decided to geek out and turn into a historian and archaeologist. And one of the things that I've found through my research is that these kitchens, especially on these plantation landscapes, these are the biggest artifacts left behind to talk about the power and agency and culture of these enslaved people who were in those spaces. So, you know, whether it's an inside kitchen or an outside kitchen, whether it was a big plantation or a small plantation, those kitchens are where power dynamics literally played out minute by minute by minute. You look at cookbooks, you read against the archive, you read against the grain. You know, an average person would open up an old cookbook and be like, oh, here's some recipes, like it's over. If you look at it critically, if you read against the grain, you start seeing these 18 scientific cookbooks and, you know, you see all of this African food being literally written into these cookbooks by the early 19th century. Things like gumbo, jambalaya. So those moments that were happening in that kitchen, when you know, the enslaved chef was cooking up something for their family, meanwhile, they're making their little pie for the white folks in the big house, moments happened in that kitchen where that food then became very popular within the big house table and then became part of American food. One of the things you also see in those cookbooks, in those spaces, is that the whole back of these cookbooks are all medicine. Right. So, you know, thinking about these kitchen spaces as an axis of power, these cooks could have killed everybody dead with one little bit of extra something in that pie. I mean, the power was there. And so instance by instance, you see in the in the archives, these moments of the white folks just being a little bit nervous. You know, you see this after Nat Turner's rebellion. It's like, I don't think white folks were getting, you know, eating anything out of that cook that kitchen for like a week after that happened because they were so afraid of being poisoned by their, their cooks. And so it's important to really think about the ways in which these individuals who were literally bound to that fire use that kitchen access, that space that was a literal crossroads between the slave quarter community and the people that were working in the big house to then navigate the bonds of enslavement, right? Whether it be through a side eye or anything else in that moment. So that's how I think of kitchens as the biggest artifact that you can see on a site. And I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> Absolutely, they really are the biggest artifacts on any site. So that's fantastic. So Psyche, through your work and experiences, what stories have you found about this sort of situation, the life of the cooker and the eater? I think you're still muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was saying that um, I agree with Kelly 100% everything she said. The kitchen is a nervous landscape, right? And that's um, John Burns, uh, is it John Burns? Or Burns' concept of the nervous landscape where he looks at um, Aborigines people and how when we enter a landscape, automatically make that landscape nervous if you will, right? Nervous because as, as, as Kelly mentioned, the power dynamics that are inherent. But I also wanna include something else here in your interpretation of cooker versus eater. Unintentionally, it erases the people who are both cooking and eating. Black folks cooked and ate <laughs> and cooked while eating and ate while cooking, you know? So I understand what you all are trying to set up there, but it's maybe, it's cooking and eating because what we end up doing is seeing black folks again in this static position of just as this or this. Um, I did an exhibition, which uh, I'm not gonna show that slide, but it's part of my slide deck um, for the National Library of Medicine for the NIH and it was fire and freedom. Um, two things, black folks were always thinking of freedom because we were always free. The question became, how do we get there? And by what mechanism do I get this? So while I'm cooking by the fireside, I'm also watching these children and donning these socks and maybe talking to two, three, four people. And I've started my day at 4 a.m. And my day's not gonna end till well after everyone else has gone to bed. And even then I may have to get up and make some mint water or whatever the case may be. How am I eating in that day? Sometimes I'm sitting down, sometimes I'm grabbing, sometimes I'm snacking, sometimes I'm doing this, that, and the other. And so I think it's important that we allow black cooks to be much more dynamic 
right? I'm um, I'm in concert. I'm in conversation with the butler. Or I'm in conversation with the the woman of the house. I'm in conversation with so many different people. I'm doing so many different things that it's a sheer miracle that this food is going to get on this table. And somewhere in there, I'm also eating and I'm throwing eyes and I'm looking at this and I'm saying this and I'm talking under my breath and I'm doing and I'm always thinking about what time is it, what day is it, what month is it, and Who's leaving today? How can I be a part of that? Can I take my mama? Can I take my sister? Can I take my child? Can I, I, I need us to be more complex when we think about these issues because otherwise we put black folks in these boxes, again, that don't allow us to be whole and dynamic people. So we cook and we eat and we procure, <laughs> you know, and we're out there milking the cow and we're in here trying to measure the, the flour and we're over here trying to wring the chicken's neck and we're over, you know, that's a different interpretation because now you see why we need ingenuity and creativity. But as long as we're put right here, you're not getting a full picture. And so that would be how I would, I would respond and compliment what, what these, uh, these other scholars are saying. Absolutely, I mean, that's really, you know, remar remarks about the sort of rich and nuanced life of all of these folks who lived here and the importance of understanding that sometimes that story isn't actually told and needs to be really brought to the forefront. So really appreciate you highlighting sort of the complexity of just a single day in the life, right? Which is so important. Yeah, and I just wanna share also, these things are messy. We make these conversations way too neat and they're not because I'm, while I'm heating up a hearth, a child could have gotten burned, I could have gotten burned, scald, killed. We, we have to tell these stories. And when you have the power to do it, if you don't, then you're remiss and you're, com you're contributing to, you know, these, um, the misinterpretation of black life. This is how we show the power and the freedom and the liberation of black people. I don't care about the, this is your interpretation, it has to look like this. As, no, it needs to be messy. It needs to be all over the place because it was. Insurrections occurred in kitchens. <laughs> Revolts occurred in kitchens. Like, like Kelly said, you know, so many of these folks, not only did they have the recipes for poison, a lot of them had the anecdote. They published the anecdotes because they knew they could be poisoned. They knew they could have glass. They knew anything could happen. Yeah. So I'll just leave it there. And it's a tremendous amount of power, right? And if you think about it, to be in that situation as an enslaved cook would be incredibly, you know, complicated, just as you say, right? And that is an incredible amount of power and they were relied on, right? So you think mm -hmm. about some of the cooks of the presidents or the former presidents of the United States and mm -hmm. all those stories that, you know, the strategies they used to keep them, not only to train them, but to keep them, right? Because they were seen as incredibly valuable valuable assets, right? And I mean, I think that's important to understand and, and it sort of dehumanizes their experience. And Cassandra, how did they keep them? In some cases, this is part of that messiness. In some cases, they, they held their children hostage yep. or they held their, their husbands or their wives hostage. That's the part of the story we don't wanna tell because we wanna focus on the food because the food is what makes us feel good. But when you say that um, they held them there because they kept their mother, or the aged father. Now we're talking about the real horrors of slavery and enslavement. And if we don't do that, then we, we're having moot conversations around food. I don't wanna hear it because this is not pretty stuff. We're talking about people in bondage whose lives have been forever for generations changed and affected by evil and hatred. And if we don't share those parts of the story when we're talking about food, then we're doing a disservice to the leg legacies and histories of black people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, um, you remind me of the situation with Josiah Henson where his mother was held on the Riley plantation when he was sent to Kentucky, right? And that he always knew that, right? And it wasn't until she had passed away that he sought his freedom, you know, and I think those two things are linked. Family is, being separated from your family is one of the, the, the greatest powers over enslaved individuals that their owners, their masters had. And I think that's incredibly prof prof profound and an important thing that can be turned to. Uh, so thank you for that. I think um, in terms of, you know, Therese, your experience um, with this very messy situation, um, 
you know, how do you think? What is your perspective on this? Well, first of all, I want to say that, and I, I'm, I think I, I probably have said this to you over the years, like, but like, honestly, when I started my work culturally, like Building Houses was one of the first books that I came across that was so, it shook my earth because it required you, required me to ask different questions about the work I was doing. This, you brought this idea about power and sort of <clears throat> the negotiation of power that the cook has um, in the kitchen historically. And it's, just, it's something so humbling and jolting about being confronted with the lack of agency you take in your career. Kelly, I don't know if you felt this, but like there's something about when you trained in this work that the stories you told about who is a credible, authentic chef um, and so much about that that disempowers Black chefs. And there's this sort of perverted posture that you take in the stories you feel like you deputize to tell. You can't show up fully. It's your full facility. It's your full cultural, like, you know, sort of background to sort of tell stories you think you want to tell. And there's this way in which your voice is limited. And reading Build a House in particular was like this wake-up call that historically I'm sort of in this unbroken chain of folk who were in circumstances that were hard, different, but always aware of personhood, aware of place, aware of the power that they sort of had to be seated in. And how dare I be in this time where there was nothing but possibility and not at least show up with that kind of same kind of confidence in me. So I would say your point about the power of the the cooker, the power of the chef, the power of the person who has your taste buds at the, you know, in their hands, I think, especially for Black chefs, I mean, you can't do this work credibly without reading Build a House. You can't read, do this work credibly without, you know, reading Bound to the Fire. Like, there's this way in which we have information that tells us about ourselves that's a counter narrative to everything else that's being sort of subversively told us about who we are. And there's this way in which there's this shit, I feel like there's this profound shift happening where, to, to your earlier question about soul food, but this space of cultural translation has happened that requires you to, to be clear about the, the work you do and why, like the, the context of it can't just be reckless. I mean, honestly, like I'm not trying to, I don't know if we're going to talk about it, so I can talk about it, but like even her new book, this question about the function of what the food space is and what are we doing? The recklessness and the sort of irresponsibility in terms of negotiating it and sort of um, engaging in that relationship. Those questions are answered so clearly when you start to read books like Sahinkies and Kelly's, but also just take more seriously and take more kind of, take more control over the ways in which you honor real history like and you get to your point about the messy parts the truth you not telling the truth you can't unknow the truth what is that i don't know absolutely thank you so much i mean i think that you know there are all kinds of um negotiations going on right now in terms of these spaces and i think it's really important to hear the the perspectives of those who actually are working in these spaces right and so it's so great. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, um, before we move on, is there any other um, any other discussion on this topic? Before we move on, we can go on to our next um, topic. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, our, my last screen share here <coughs> is going to be um, uh, the intro to the next topic, which is this ad. Um, and I think this is a really, to me, a really central part of sort of this discussion. Um, all of these things sort of revolve around, um, sort of get coalesced in this topic and in this ad, right? So this is a, um, an image of the Uncle Tom stereotype, which is part of a cream of wheat uh, advertising campaign. So Uncle Tom, of course, was a character from Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel. Um, and uh, her, she was a very strong hero and, you know, this amazing character. And was based, um, you know, in large part on Josiah Henson, right? And that, so that powerful and very positive understanding of what the Uncle Tom, Tom character was 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 warped and perverted over the years um, by the white culture, 
to sort of be what is represented in this image and has become a stereotype along with many others. And so many of them are related to food and, you know, as Psyche, you've indicated before, and the power over food and using those images in controlling. Um, and so this is a topic that we take uh, very seriously at the museum because one of our museum our rooms, one of the biggest room in our museum is actually dedicated to the idea of stereotypes, how it pervasive and how destructive it is um, and where and sort of, you know, going back in the understanding where it comes from and how something as powerful as the Uncle Tom and the novel gets transformed into something like this. So um, we just want to spend some time talking about that. So, so Saiki, I'll begin with you. Do you want to talk about the, the stereotypes and images used against Black people surrounding food culture, just and continue that conversation? Okay, sure. Um, so I'm going to just quickly share my screen here. Um, okay, here we go. Um, I want to go back to something that you said, Therese, that um, I thought was so powerful about knowing the truth to untell the truth. Or I want I want to make sure I got that. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it after. But you said something about telling the truth and knowing the truth. Um, and 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 it's a it's, it segues into this piece here about stereotypes because the the nineteen twenty one ad comes later, right, actually. Prior to that, you had, um, at the advent of technology, the moment that you could do paintings and, and sheet music and all kinds of things, uh, you had these advertisements and, and they were designed to portray a certain message. And this is from taken from my book, my first book, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, where you see this top hat and the suit jacket and the big lips and the bulging eyes. Well, that was an intentional image, right? Because it was designed at a time when black people were um, acquiring political power. Um, the first silent film, uh, not the first silent film, but the, the film um, was The Birth of a Nation, which shows African-American political power. If you look very carefully late in the film, there's a, 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 an African-American man or a black man sitting with a big like turkey or chicken leg in a hat, in a top hat and a, in a suit jacket. And so the more pervasive these kinds of images are, here you have the Coon Chicken Inn, which is a real restaurant located in Portland, Seattle and Salt Lake City. And the more you can create these images of the asexual black woman, undesirable, you know, only a mammy associated with Southern cooking and things of that nature, then the more you can perpetuate these images, right? Stereotypes are, are interesting because there's a tad bit of truth in there, but it's when we distort that truth that we begin to get um, these other interpretations. And so I've not had the benefit of being at the Josiah Henson Museum, but I would encourage you all, even as you have these stereotypes in that room, that you untell the story which is what Therese is talking about. And you, you show images such as these, right? Where this more is an accurate picture that was drawn of a black woman at the train station in Richmond, who was an entrepreneur, um, or this woman here who was captured on a, on a, on a, on a, um, on a calendar as a businesswoman uh, in, in Corinth, uh, uh, Mississippi, who along with her daughter used the notion of uh, uh, a, a, a woman who could pass her daughter, who was a light, very, very fair skin. Um, she traveled as her daughter's companion and was able to sell her food. And then of course we know the women of Gordonsville who I've written about extensively, who were their own early black entrepreneurs, right? And so it's important even amidst these kinds of stereotypes that exist because they still exist. When President Obama <laughs> was elected, you know, I, I can't tell you how many um, emails I got about watermelon and chicken as it relates to Obama, as if people somehow thought that that was a wonderful way to honor um, his presidency. Um, and then, of course, we always get folks who are like, well, what? I don't understand. I don't know about the stereotype. Well, what made you think that it was OK to put this black man with this piece of food? Right. And so I would encourage you and you as you do this work of telling and untelling black people's histories and lives that are messy and complex and beautiful and enriching um, that alongside the stereotype, you're not trying to combat the stereotype. You're showing a more complex and bigger picture 
of Black people's lives. It's important that we not worry about because we're never we, we need to stop being in defense mode <laughs> about who we are. We are who we are, the messiness of our lives, just like other people's. Okay, so we do have stereotypes. Some of us buy into the stereotypes. Some of us say, I'm eating all the stereotypes today, chicken, watermelon, whatever you name it. All right, that's beauty. That's beauty. All right, but it's equally beautiful to know that's not all we eat. And so it's important that we worry less about I'm pushing back about. No, that I'm telling more, I'm telling different food stories with Black people. I'm telling bigger food stories. I'm telling wider food stories. I'm telling food stories about Black people's lives you didn't even know. Um, I, I applaud Kelly, you and, and, and Chef Holland for talking about California. We don't know anything hardly about New England. What do we know about Miss, uh, Michigan and the Great Lakes? What do we know about Seattle and Portland, aside from the Coon Chicken Inn? There are so many stories out there that we need to tell about Black people and food um, that the stereotype, while important, is a small part <laughs> of the larger picture of African American and Black food ways. Also, it's the part that's meant to silence. It's the part that's meant to make you feel small and disempowered mm -hmm. and willing to forfeit your voice mm -hmm. and your power in that way. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that is exactly how what their intention is and mm -hmm. how they were used and wielded. Um, and I think, you know, what's interesting is that that's how, you know, those of us of my generation and older, you know, they we understand maybe where some of that comes from. But so my sons, for example, are of an age where they there's a disconnect. They may not get it right so i do feel like there's a certain amount of edu almost education but i don't know what is that i mean do you do you see that that sort of shift is you know a good one and maybe that that in, instead of focusing on these images and stereotypes it's more about promoting as you say these sort of strong stronger positive images you know do you know what i mean about that cultural shift that sometimes takes place mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean i think it goes back to what dr Person just said, I mean, this the shift I think is internal. It has nothing to do with other folks. And folks outside the culture can't, I can't be I can't, the the energy it takes to react to foolishness that's meant to distract is buying into the purpose. So your point about stereotypes is only so valuable as much as I accept the premise. The mm -hmm. kind the, the broader context allows you to absorb, see, and understand the, the, the image itself, but then to sort of start from a place of prime primacy, right? When you move the lens into black culture first, then mm -hmm. all of that other stuff is so small and it seems so petty and it's less, it steals the power from me immediately. Mm -hmm. Right, this is why, okay, so, right, right, okay. This is why my book is not about chicken, fried chicken. This is why the book is not about stereotypes. That's at the very beginning, because I want you to know about that. What my story was really more concerned with are Black lives and the things we do with food. It's a small part at the very beginning, an important part, but it's not the central part. And to, uh, and to, to raise this point, um, Chef, you're right on point, because if we focus on that, we, we spend too much time detracting. This is what I meant by we're not in defense mode. We don't have to defend our lives. We don't have to defend our culture. We don't have to defend our heritage. We live it every day. This is why I started with soul as an action, right? As opposed to a, a description. Because when we get into relying upon these reductionist ways of seeing black life, we can stay there. And one thing I know, being black all my life and late in my fifties, is I don't live my life in apology. We don't live our lives in apology. I live my life in its dynamism. And today I may eat chicken, tomorrow I may not. The next day I may be a vegetarian and the next day I may be a pescatarian. It's all right, because I'm gonna do all of that. And we need to give black folks the ability to just live. We're so busy trying to put categories in. I don't know of any other culture where we do that. Why is it so necessary? You know why? Because we have power. We have power and, and honestly, our country is afraid of that power. We built this country on the backs of our labor, our blood, our children being killed, our children being sold. And so if we could, as a people, mobilize that power, we saw it happen many times before in insurrections, we saw it happen in the civil rights movement when we shut the whole thing down. We're not going to work. 
if we would mobilize our power and believe in our strength, this country wouldn't be ready. So they do everything they can. They keep us from voting, try to keep us from voting, which is a whole other story. But all of this is tied directly into that. Food is not separate from those things. And this is the thing that drives me nuts because we want to have so much, we want to focus on the celebratory nature of food. And that's important. But as a material culture scholar, objects have power. They have power. And it's important that people keep that power, that knowledge from us so that we can't get ahead to the liberation that we are constantly trying to get. So no, my work is not about a stereotype. My work is about trying to explain to you the myriad ways in which Black people have done phenomenal things from feeding families to sending kids to school to building houses to you know, shucking and jiving to culinary dozens, you name it, we do it all. And, and we need to do that as, as I've heard Kelly say 99,000 times and maybe one more, we do it unapologetically and without any sort of hesitation um, and, and we be who we are. That's up to everybody else to adapt, not for us to change. That's fantastic. And I really appreciate that uh, perspective and, and you sharing that. And I think that it, you, your point is well taken in terms of how the museum operates and the importance of the stereotype. I think that is that is something that we should absolutely be, you know, incorporating into how we present it since it's so central. So thank you for that. And actually, that makes a nice segue onto the next, um, you know, food justice is our last um, and our next and last topic. And so that actually, you know, your points about how it's intertwined in all these things, food is wonderful, it's celebratory, as you say, it also um, comes with all these other things that are not so great and that we do need to address. So the next topic is about food justice. Um, and so, um, and, and I'll, have, I'll leave the first question for you, Psyche, which is that um, the term kitchen as a platform is used uh, in the academic world. And can you sort of share a little bit more about this concept uh, with us as we begin this conversation? I'm happy to do that, but I, I really, if you don't mind, want to defer to the chefs first because sure. they're, they spend their, 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 uh, a lot of their cultural lives, um, a lot of their culinary cultural lives in, in kitchens. And so I would love to build off of what they have to say. Um, Absolutely. Therese, you want to go ahead and address any of the food justice and uh, part I'm interested in what Kelly has to say as well, but I'll just, I'll just briefly say, one of the things I guess I'm sitting with more today than maybe when I first started the cultural part of my work is the ways in which Black chefs could be deputized really effectively um, in sort of these brilliant and massive justice food justice movements. We see most power, I think, in the most, I'm in community with a lot of farmers and a lot of sort of food, like people who seek their work primarily in food justice. And so often chefs are not part of those conversations or in that space because there's this disconnection between the frivolity or the sort of capitalist nature of restaurants and sort of the practical professional application of food. Um, and it doesn't seem to be cognitive kind of connection between the work they're doing and the work we're doing. And I think that's just false. What I would say is that being a community of folks whose main life, I mean, again, I'm so excited for people to finally to get Dr. Forsen's new book, but like this idea about the your, who you are, your life, your life is a consumer, like your life consuming food. We disconnect professionally sometimes from what that what your personal relationship is with food versus what your professional relationship is and the massive shifts that could happen if chefs primarily saw their, their work as not just a capitalistic endeavor but sort of a especially black chefs being in community with folks who are fighting for the lives of black people every day um i think that the massiveness of that kind of shift would be brilliant um, but yeah, I want to hear from Kelly because I know she got some fire. 
just want to say too, I am so energized by y'all's comments and your passion for what you do. Um, I do just want to like just take a moment to realize that we're having this like really important sort of flashpoint in history right now. You know, I've, I'm 46. I've been, you know, I was a chef for a long time. My whole family's in the business. My father was an archaeologist. I've been steeped in both worlds. There is something really magical happening right now where we've got the scholarship picking up. We've got a rise in, in um, the sort of visibility of the of the Black chefs that are popping up everywhere that whose voices are finally being heard. And I really want to beg everyone who's listening to this to provide platforms like the one that's that's here right now, now where you have a combination of chefs and scholars, because every single person, racist, you know, or not, wants to hear about food. And that's how I get them to come to my talks. Like, oh, there's this nice little white lady. I'm gonna go hear about biscuits. And it's like, oh, surprise, <laughs> like, let's get messy. Like right now, we're talking about some real, you know, ish. So I really, really beg people to that can host these kinds of events to be able to allow this kind of voice, these kind of voices to happen, because this has been phenomenal. And I'm just gonna stop right there. I would say though, the thing that I guess I'm sitting with as well, one of the reasons why I started my site was because we are, I was reckless in my work, not reckless in a, in a harmful way, but reckless because I didn't know enough about Black culture, I didn't know enough about like what the power I had in the work I was could the power I could have in the work I was doing if it was seated more firmly um in context and historical context and I think so much of the flashpoint that Kelly's talking about is this awakening of chefs to sort of see the broad context of black culture as a tool in their work and so I agree with Kelly 100 percent in terms of um the power of this kind of cross disciplinary exchange but I think that it the the buy-in or the sort of call to action I've always sort of sat with is getting chefs to be more concerned with um rigor right the things I think a lot about how the hog just came out right we sit in with this like come to Jesus, like religious moment people have had watching this series on Netflix. Like, the visual aspect of it. I love everybody. Those are my people. I love all those people who were involved in that, that project. But Dr. Harris's book is a decade old. That series is built on a book that has been available to Black chefs for a decade. Dr. Forsen's book was 2006. If you were doing this work at any point, you had her words available to you. And so I, can, I was just saying that like, there's this way in which, and it's humbling because when you talk about activism or sort of justice work, you talk about people who are dealing with the real, everyday, serious, political aspect, the stakes of the work that they're doing are so high. So you can't come to the table as a dilettante, not willing to do your part, your work, your primary work, that work that has nothing to do with other folks, has nothing to do with the identity politics, nothing to do with you feeling good and the emotional, like uh, that's, you do that work with your therapist. When you're showing up to this table of activist work, one, do your primary work, right? Show up willing to be quiet a little, make me a little quiet, listening to best practices, best information, but just this, this idea about, I don't know, just so much information to know and yeah, we need to be as rigorous about Kone technique as we are about information and sort of history. Well, I think that it, to both of you all's point, it is a flashpoint moment. And we're also at a point where for better, or for worse, but perhaps for worse, when President Obama was elected, because we are devoid at times of our history, of the knowledge of our history, I think we felt like we had overcome. And so people relaxed way too much. But those of us who have been studying history and historical movements knew that this time was coming. And why do I bring that up? Because folks are so comfortable that they think for some reason that food and black culture is, and the work that we do in these spaces is devoid from history. So I tried to post in the Q&A and I just asked our IT people to post it for me, the story of Georgia Gilmore, who during the um, civil rights movement in Mississippi cooked 
and had voter registration drives um, and was a major supporter and, um, uh, and provide, helped to provide a solid foundation for the Montgomery bus boycott. Okay, so there was a time in our historical lives that we never saw any part of our lives really divorced from action and social action. I don't care if you were preaching, speaking, cooking, cleaning, you did everything you could to be at the forefront of justice. But now we have a generation of folks who think all they have to do is cook, despite the fact that they can't get loans, um, for to open their businesses, despite the fact that um, they can't pay a living wage, despite the fact that they can't offer health care, um, we as a people cannot afford to buy into these moment by moment shifts and so forth that do not speak to our history, our present and our future, because they are all interconnected because this country is not designed to see black people progress. Food is not remiss from this conversation. And this is the frustration I have with too much celebration around food. I think that's appropriate. I think it's wonderful, you know, but as I keep saying, there's so many aspects of, of food culture that need to be discussed. And many of them are tied to food activism. And it's not all around farming. Farm to table is one aspect. Um, paying living wages is a major aspect. Offering healthcare is another aspect. Um, being able to access loans, whether you're in urban areas, you're in suburban areas, or you're, if you're in, uh, in rural areas, those are all parts of our food culture. It's wonderful that we celebrate um, our food histories, but activism, real activism says, I need to help or be in conversation with these millions of Black farmers out here who have lost their farms or who, who have seen their farms taken away. I need to be in conversation with these people who because of gentrification have been moved from their transportation sources, their food sources and so forth, and are now pushed down into the hinterlands and now are considered in food deserts. Don't write about me in a food desert, put me somewhere with affordable housing where I can get access to food, whether it's a farmer's market, a bodega, a grocery store, whatever the case may be. And I just think that we need to have these more complicated conversations. But of course, I also know that we don't like to do that because complication worries all of us. And yet black folk live at the interstices of complication every day of navigating our genders, our races, our classes, our sexualities, our cultures, our heritages, all of that. That's who, who we are, that's how we live. Um, and we, we celebrate and we have joy. We celebrate and we have joy. Food is one part of that, music, dance, you know, conversation, clothing, all of that. All of those material culture aspects of our lives bring us joy. And food is tied into every one of those. I, I, I tire of trying to dissect black life by saying, we're just gonna talk about this and we're only gonna talk about it and we're only gonna celebrate it. It's, it's a part of everything. Um, and I think that we need to remember when we talk about activism that we all have a duty and we as black folks have a collective duty based on some shared experiences um, and also based on just how we move through society. It's not enough that just one person gets through. That's very, thank you very much for that. Um, and I want to, we're drawing close to the end of our, um, our hour. So uh, we can continue with this part of the discussion or if there's, um, if you all want to keep going um, or we can um, turn to the Q and A. Uh, so I wanted to just see if you all, we have a couple of questions, a lot of uh, amens in the chat, in the Q and A. So um, people are hearing and, and saying that. Um, we, one of the questions we have, um, um, here, let me, I think I might read it. There's always some sort of myth that comes from around Black History Month concerning food. I've seen posts about hush puppies were thrown to dogs to silence them when a slave was running away. Can any of you speak to the origin of that particular phrase, hush puppy? For um, all kinds of random like, <laughs> tales. <laughs> right, right. Um, Pastor Wyckoff, that's a good question. I don't, you know, I have lots of food encyclopedias in my office, but, and, you know, we're friends on Facebook. I'll try to um, 
uh, uh, research that and share that information from you. you. You raise a really good point, I think. If anyone has watched the, I think it was on TNT, uh, the drama production Underground, um, they opened up some very interesting and wonderful visuals of, of um, those who ran away, including the use of herbs and so forth to poison dogs. But I had not seen the one um, on the hush puppies. And I, I would only imagine that if something was thrown to dogs to, to keep them from following them, it would have been some food laced with some herb probably, right? When you think, yeah, Kelly, don't you think that's the case as well? To throw them off the scent? Yeah, or something, because it's also, you know, thinking about what it would take to run away. And, mm -hmm. you know, you need food for a few days. Are you really going to throw the last little bit of something at a dog that's running after you right. and it's going right. to eat it like that and keep running? Right. So for me, it's unless one of those things where- Unless you created it for that, right. Unless you created it a little it secret poison pod or something. That's but right. I can yeah, almost see right. it being like, even just in a kitchen, just being like, hush puppy, like little drop of something just to keep the mm -hmm. dog quiet while you're cooking. But, mm -hmm. you know- yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. But you know, there's some fabulous work out there. My colleague, um, Cheryl LaRoche, um, did a wonderful book um, where she talks about the landscape and how enslaved people who were running away used the landscape. And again, I think sometimes we forget, but if you remember that the world was not like it is right now, and so people are running through brush and they're running barefoot and sometimes they don't have any clothes and sometimes they're walking and sometimes they're hiding in tree stumps or using um, swamps and so forth um, and trees and, and gullies. And, you know, I'm with, I'm with, you know, Dr. Dietz on this one that people may have packed some things, um, but it wasn't just dogs that you were worried about. You had snakes and other kinds kinds of wildlife that you had to buy spiders, you know, I'm sure there are many folks um, whose lives were lost just trying to run away. So it was a dangerous prospect. And here again, I'll just say this and then be quiet. But this is one of the things that when we see it on TV, we think it's so easy. They just ran from here to here. But I heard a great story down in London town about eight years ago, um, where folks from the Maryland Historical Archives gave a presentation. And when they talked about what the terrain would have been like, just from one, like Montgomery County, where Josiah Henson is to get to Washington, DC. And if you remember that many enslaved men, women, and children didn't have shoes or anything on their feet at certain times, or didn't maybe didn't have the proper clothing, that was an incredible feat. It was an incredible feat. The fact that Harriet Tubman was able to go back as many times as she did was incredible, not just for the dangers to herself, but just trying to traverse the terrain. And those are the stories that we need to hear more of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that, especially in the time of a car, like for us, it's just we get in a car and drive there. But of course, if you actually had to walk it and then the conditions, as you mentioned, it is a true, um, it's a hardship, right? To do those things just to, you know, Henson would actually take the produce to go sell it in Georgetown. And he talks about, he would get up before dawn and a huge journey and we'd come back late at night. And it's a big deal that we sort of take for granted and don't really think about. So I think that's an excellent um, point to be made about just traveling in landscape. And we often forget about landscape as an important element to all of this, um, all of these spaces, landscape, it's a cultural feature as well, and often was used to hem in people, in particular mm -hmm. slaves. Um, so there is um, a question specifically, oh, I think you might be even answering the question about the traveling companion for the daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go ahead, and I think there's another question here about justice. Um, someone speaks, um, I recently listened to a congressional hearing on C-SPAN about food insecurity on college campuses, particularly HBCU uh, campuses, um, and a lot of them in or, in or near food deserts. Um, and so, you know, if, you, if, there any, if anyone has any comments about justice in terms of where these tend to be located, do um, you see a connection here? Um, let me just look at that question really quickly. Um, they're talking about food desert HBCUs that there's- some, Yeah, it's being located, location of them typically in food deserts. Um, 
I mean, and, and quite often that is the case uh, it, it, according to this report that they were on. Um, I, I just will say very quickly, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Um, and I think we need to interrogate again, the shorthand conversations we hear about what a food desert is. I lived in suburban Maryland for a long time. And by all accounts, I was in a food desert because you had to have a car to get to the market. Um, so, it, you know, we've made a lot out of this and people have gotten a lot of money to do studies on it and so forth. Let's first of all, let's be clear about urban design and where black communities are located and what resources we bring to these communities. So there's that. Secondly, let's remember that folks resource and source food from different places. Not everybody sources from a grocery store. Not everybody sources from a farmer's market or a local market. People sometimes source from their own gardens, from their own pantries, from relatives. People, um, nowadays you also can, can order in groceries, which a lot of people did during the pandemic. So there are multiple ways to access food. And if you're talking about an HBCU, most of them have cafeterias and food service. And if you live on campus, you have to probably have a food service con uh, contract. So there's that. And then um, most of these HBCUs were, were founded around agriculture. They were early, early purveyors of, of agricultural learning. And so um, food options um, are certainly uh, uh, somewhere uh, um, available to them. Maybe not those that are desirable, but there are food um, operations that are close by. And if not, then they're pretty much those HBCUs are gonna be just like the rest of us living in society um, and, and trying to figure out how to access food. Only thing I wanna to add to that, because I, I would say, you know, you as a professor probably have different insight in terms of this, what the college experience is for students in general, but food security in that way, like I think, I don't know, my, my young, I haven't had a benefit of going to an HBCU, but I'm thinking about Dylan, I'm thinking, you know, think, folks I know at Dillard, my youngest sister went to Clark. The idea, especially in Black culture, about mutual aid and the sort of ability of, you know, young Black folks and their ingenuity, I mean, the, the kind of creativity and sort of mutual aid that they take with them to these spaces are kind of the point of going to HBC. So I would wonder about what the context of this report and sort of what the the sort of metrics would be because I would think that college campuses in general with students who come from different socioeconomic you know backgrounds would you be able to talk about food insecurity on college campuses period but I would surmise I would think I would just sort of posit that perhaps you know the kind of creativity and I don't know community centered um support that would be present on HBCU campus would be probably more and more like valuable, powerful than on other kinds of campuses or you know, predominantly white institutions. I don't know. I would think that they're probably even better or more in community and um, have tighter networks of support than other kinds of campuses. You're right. I mean, mutual aid societies have long been a part of, of black culture. We've sent care boxes. Um, what about people who are coming from outside the U.S. from around the African diaspora? How are they getting the foods that sustain them? You know, Therese has mentioned a couple of times, reference to my books, in my forthcoming book, Eating While Black, Race, Food Shaming and Race in America, I, I talk about the experience of, of Black immigrants um, from the Caribbean and from African countries and coming to this country. How are they getting access to that food? Um, having been married to a Ghanaian man for 15 years, we, you know, I saw him make substitutions all the time. You know, if you couldn't get fufu, you, you went to cream of wheat, you know, but a tomato, an onion, and a hot pot, you can make light soup, you know, and a, throw a piece of meat in there, some chicken, some beef, some goat meat, whatever. So I, I think we need to be a little more critical of those kinds of studies. Um, because there's uh, clearly, as Therese has, has elaborated on perfectly, there's some lack of information about how people source food, I think, and, and, and make it happen. Great. Thank you very much for addressing those questions. Um, I think we might be at the end of our, our panel discussion. If anyone has any last thoughts before we um, sort of conclude. 
now's, now's the time. I will say it was an honor to be on this panel with you ladies. Y'all are amazing. And, you know, Psyche's been to Stratford, but Therese, you got to come down and check it out. <laughs> and you too, Cassandra. Thank you all for having me as well and us at the Josiah Henson folks. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to getting out to the Josiah Henson when it when we're able to move about freely. Um, I, you know, thank you all for for inviting me to participate. I, I really do look forward to to being a part of uh, that visual um, um, visiting experience. This is awesome. I mean, these women, these they have given me they straightened my spine professionally for so many years and. To sort of be in conversation with them has been, I don't know, big highlight. So this has been dope. You too, Therese. Always, always love listening to you um, and working with you. So thank you. And I just want to say it has been really a fascinating and absolutely um, amazing, engrossing hour. And I really appreciate all of you taking the time and the thoughtfulness with which you came and shared your perspectives and. I hope everyone in the audience also feels the same way and we really appreciate it. And we, you are absolutely welcome anytime. Come up, let, let us know, we absolutely come visit us. Um, we are here. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and end there. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody in the audience for listening and for participating with the questions. Um, we are going to, um, in two in two weeks we'll be having another uh virtual event you can um that's going to be called meeting of the minds and it's a it's a discussion imagine discussion between uh josiah henson and harriet tubman and frederick Douglass. so mm -hmm. if you're interested in that <coughs> look on our website and uh see about registering for that and i think that'll be it thank you so much again for all the food for thought and we hope you have a great day bye